Okay, good evening everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our evening seminar series. I'm Noreen Lejan, I'm director of the center here at the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies. And I know that some of you have already signed up to our mailing list, but if you haven't, please do to keep up with our events and other activities, and you can also follow us on Twitter as well. But now, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you for our topic for this evening, Women and AI, Harms, Impacts and Remedies. And joining us this evening on our panel, it's like a larger panel than usual, is uh, quite a diverse set of experts who've all published and have researched in the area of representations of bias, discrimination and fairness within the context of artificial intelligence. So our first speaker this evening is Dr. Nina Power, here on my right. Nina is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Northampton. Her re excuse me? No, 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 I said allegedly, I was being a joke. I mean, I am. Allegedly. <laughs> I so it's just a place According to the sources I checked. I know. <laughs> no, I am, I am. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to correct me on any further details as, as, I, as I come up. <laughs> Her research and publication include the areas of feminism, class, policing, justice, and politics. She's also an editor of the publication of Historical Materialism and a regular contributor to The Guardian and Wired magazine. And our second speaker this evening is Dr. Sarah Dillon. Sarah is director of the AI and Narrative Justice Program at the University of Cambridge Labourism Centre for the Future of Intelligence, LCFI. She's also a lecturer in literature at film and the <coughs> English at the University of Cambridge. And her many publications include her 2018 monograph on deconstruction, feminism, and film, published by Edinburgh University Press. And she's also a regular contributor to BBC Radio 3 and Radio 4. Our third speaker this evening, on your toes here, we've mixed them up in terms of in terms of succession of speaking, is Dr. Ruben Finns. Ruben is a postdoctoral researcher in computer science at the University of Oxford. He's also recently appointed as research fellow at the Information Commissioner's Office at the UK Data Protection Authority. His most recent publications and research are focused on third-party tracking on the web, mobile, on the Internet of Things, and also on transparency, fairness, and accountability in profiling and machine learning. And last, but not at all, not at all least, our final speaker for this evening's panel is Dr. Yendrik Niklas. Yendrik is a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Media and Communication at the University of Leeds. Prior to this, he was a research officer on the Justice, Equity and Technology Project at the London School of Economics, and he was also a legal expert at the Panopticon Foundation, where he was involved in policy and research in areas of surveillance, data protection, and e-government. His publications and research focus on the relationship between socioeconomic rights, new technologies, and public institutions. So you can see we have a slightly larger panel than usual this evening, so approximately each of our speakers will present for about eight to ten minutes each. Once they have concluded their presentations, our postdoctoral researcher Rachel, here on the left hand side, will be providing a response to their presentations. We'll then open up the discussion to the floor for Q&A. Following that, we have a wide reception as you can see, which I hope you can all stay and join us for. So I'd like, now let's thank our panel and all of you for joining us here this evening. And I would like Nina to begin our discussions on this evening's seminar topic of women in AI, harms, impacts, and remedies. Right, great. Uh, thanks for that. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to keep within the eight to ten minutes. I don't have any uh, images. Um, I mean, partly because, well, I didn't make one, but um, <laughs> also because I suppose what I'm interested in in relation to this topic is the question of the voice and I guess the question of pitch and gender. So I'm not really <coughs> going to be talking so much technically about AI, because I wouldn't be able to do that, um, nor about the law, but I'm very interested in these questions. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some research I did a few years ago um, that I'm still very interested in, which is to do, I suppose, with the, the politics of the female sounding voice, um, primarily in public space. Of course, we're also talking about um, personal technologies and the kind of voices of Siri and uh, Alexa and that kind of, uh, perhaps we can see as a sort of trajectory from the, the secretary, the assistant, you know, very gendered as a kind of uh, personal technology. But what I was interested in in relation uh, to, uh, to a political question of public space was uh, the use of the female sounding female sounding pre-recorded voice in, in public space. So that would include things like railway, uh, hubs, uh, the, the voice of the tube, Emma Clark, 
for example, who was fired for making a parody of her own voice, very interesting about who <coughs> owns the voice, <laughs> what you're allowed to do with it. Um, but yeah, I guess so, I was thinking a bit about the, um, so for example, like 70% of these pre-recorded voices in the UK are, are female, it's estimated to be, right? So there's a kind of question about, well, why? What is it about the, the female voice or the female sounding voice um, and particularly when we think about the, the future and like if you go back and look at imaginations of what the future uh, might sound like, it would often be like robotic voices. I and mean, we, we actually don't have those robotic uh, gender neutral voices. Actually human beings tend to gender voices uh, almost immediately and unconsciously. Human beings do not respond particularly well, according to the research, to gender ambiguous voices, right? Which raises very interesting questions about pitch and who we assume is speaking. And a lot of these things, I think, are happening, uh, yeah, pre-consciously. Okay, but at the same time, someone is making decisions about who, what these voices are. Like, why are these voices uh, predominantly female uh, in public uh, spaces as well as in private, uh, I mean, intimate uh, technologies, right? So, my, I'm coming from that public space, so idea, which is to say, well, how does this affect how we think about politics and the sphere of politics and if you like the sound of politics and polis in the sense of like the city like the space of discourse the space of like who belongs where and what effect in a certain way consciously or unconsciously do these voices have so i'm leaving aside if you like the question of utility because of course you might say look the voices that on the buses telling you the stops of course they have a use right they're useful for visually impaired people they you know there's a way in which these voices serve a function. So I'm not interested in the functional question, although that is important. What I'm interested in is perhaps a more vague idea of what these voices do to our conception of, let's say, the city, of political representation, uh, particularly in relation to gender. So we have a sort of quasi-public space, right? We could say, like, you know, when you're walking through Waterloo Station, is this a public space? Not really clear. There's a certain kind of way in which one moves through these transport hubs, like with these voices, like disembodied voices, right? And the city, it seems to me, is made up often of uh, disembodied voices and voiceless bodies. If you think about the relationship between sort of advertising on the one hand, often, you know, with women, and then the female sounding voice. And so I was thinking, well, you know, in terms of political representation, if we look at kind of in the strict sense, like who is in charge, who are the MPs, you know, there's actually an interesting inverse correlation between the percentage of female sounding voices in public, disembodied voices, and the number of women MPs, for example. So it's kind of 70-30, right, very interesting uh, uh, switch. So one way of thinking, and this is speculative, of course, is to ask the question about what do these voices do to us? Like, who is speaking? to us, right? If we could say, perhaps in Syrian Alexa, there's an assistant, secretary, and often the way in which people behave to these voices, the kinds of things that men often say, in particular, to these voices, are often very misogynist, right? They're often very kind of unpleasant things, like Siri do this, it may be a joke, right? But <coughs> who, is the vo who is the voice of the public, in that sense, like the female sounding disembodied voice? Um, and it, is it like a kind of nanny? Think about ideas of the nanny state. You know, it's a very British image. Something like Mary Poppins. You know, think about Thatcher's voice, the kind of voice training that she had. There are questions of class, the idea of received pronunciation. Emma Clark's voice, for example, on the tube, it's a question of pitch. So also in war, women's voices obviously tend to have a higher pitch, so they can be heard over machinery, right? So again, there is a kind of practical consideration, you know, about pitch. Pitch doesn't work very well for older people, so often things for older people will be recorded by men because the, you lose the higher pitches, right? So there is that kind of, again, always the, the technical, practical comes back in, but there's still a kind of excess of the political or the unconscious effect maybe of these voices. You know, is this a teacher? Is this a nanny? Is this a mother? Is this, you know? And there's something about Emma Clark's voice in particular, the voice of the tube, which is quite sort of chromium quite sort of like London metal, you know, she has a very, very sort of succinct voice. It's, it's not exactly RP in the old sense, it doesn't have a richness, but it has a kind of, uh, it cutting through, you know, and it, in a sense it becomes the sound of the city. 
you know, like, and what does it mean to sort of be a person traveling uh, through the city, listening or hearing, you know, depending how attentive we are being uh, to these voices. And I suppose once I started noticing these voices a few years ago, I couldn't stop hearing them, right? They were kind of everywhere, you know. And so I became completely obsessed with this, <laughs> the female sighted voice. And, you know, some of the technology is very interesting. Like I say, they're using often real women's voices. So, so voice trained artists, so Emma Cup, for example, she, she advertises lots of things. Uh, her voice is often in supermarket adverts. She talks, she can't travel on the tube because she, she can't bear the sound of her own voice. Uh, and she talks very uh, amusingly about going to supermarkets and hearing adverts in her voice for cut price meat and how she, you know, recoils. You know, everybody has this very complicated relation to the hearing their own voice, even voice artists, yeah. And, um, so often these recordings will be of real people's voices, they're not artificially generated, but often they are concatenated, which is to say the voice is divided into blocks. So for example, if you're on the train station and you hear the 659 to Darlington will be, you know, so these are blocks, so the, the voice is real, right, but the blocks are sort of concatenated, right, that's what it's, what it's called. So in a sense that at that level we don't have uh, a fully uh, I don't know, automated or robotic voice generated uh, world. What we live in is a strange combination, at least at the level of this sort of public or quasi public I'm talking about, um, which is a mixture of like perhaps the algorithmic and the, and the human. You know, and we live perhaps in that, that strange, uh, slightly uncanny uh, atmosphere. And so perhaps one of the concepts I wanted to maybe stress or bring up um, today was a kind of speculative idea I had about. Um, I suppose they call it soft coercion, right? So what does it mean to have these voices, these female voices, often telling you what to do, but not directly commanding you, you know? So women's voices and, you know, we can look at voice, uh, like musicians, like Laurie Anderson, for example, very interesting. She plays around with pitch shifting. Uh, she calls it audio drag. So she has a voice of authority figure, who's a man, which is her voice pitch shifted in which she does parody this kind of political speech. You know, so what does it mean to be a man speaking? You know, and, and in political situations, both men and women, I hate to tell you, respond better to the male voice than the female, right? The, the male voice is perceived to be much more commanding in particular, in political scenarios. So we can ask this sort of, shift the question a little bit and say, what are these voices doing, these female voices? Yeah, one minute, I've done, I'm always done. Manning way. <laughs> You know, so they're kind of general. you know, it's not someone telling you or shouting at you, move here, go here, your train is there, it's not that, but it's a kind of gently coercive uh, voice uh, in a certain way. Um, and I wonder, I would maybe just finish on this, like, you know, does this kind of reinforce sort of gender stereotypes in a certain way? Is it kind of undermining them? You know, when we have the dominance of female voices in the quasi-public sphere, does this, what effect, if any, does this have on our thinking about politics and the voice of politics uh, more generally? Like, who gets to speak and who is heard? Thank you, Nina. That was really fascinating, and I really like that idea of the nudging power of the female voice as yeah. opposed to the more... Uh, instructive or, or commanding, like the sound of my voice a couple of seconds ago. Yep. <laughs> Sarah, whenever you're ready. Cool. I, I do have pictures, primarily because I'm working on text, and if I put the text up, I don't have to spend time reading it. You can read it while I keep talking. Um, I am a broadcaster as well, an academic, I've never had a problem listening to my own voice, uh, which is probably why I ended up going into broadcasting. You're well. unusual. Academia. Very unusual. Yeah. Uh, right, there we go. Okay, I also didn't have time to print this up, so forgive me for juggling the screens. So, um, thank you very much for having me here this evening. Um, so what I'm going to give you in ten minutes is uh, a succinct view into a, a larger paper which Rachel and Laura have very kindly uh, read and fed back on. And the purpose of that paper, the title is up there, is to strengthen the evidence base that gendering virtual personal assistants, VPAs, uh, causes societal harm. Because we need a stronger evidence base if we're going to support and inform any initiatives to then address that harm. So it's, prete it's pretending that I'm not talking to an audience that thinks, already thinks it's a problem that we only have these female voices. Yeah? So how do you convince somebody who doesn't think that's a problem? It doesn't matter, you know? But it does. And so this is an attempt to explain why. 
Uh, it's also part of a larger body of work I'm doing at the moment um, on making a case for why stories and literature and literary criticism need to be taken seriously and included in any kind of multidisciplinary evidence base in relation to policy making and decision making. So it's part of that context too, and part of another body of work on literature and artificial intelligence. So there's various um, methodologies we could use to strengthen this evidence base. There's research within sociology, social psychology, anthropology, quantitative method methodologies, qualitative method methodologies. All of these could be used to investigate the long-term and short-term effects of human interaction with gender BPAs or other forms of gender voices. But research employing methodologies of the humanities, including those of feminist philosophy, history, and literary studies, also, I maintain, have an important role to play. So I've argued elsewhere that the sociology of scientific knowledge must include attention to literature as what Shaping calls one of the social agencies that transmit knowledge. And a thought of as part of the background against which we think and practice and scientists think and practice. Um, and similarly, philosophical, historical and literary critical methods must inform the study of the social effects of emerging technologies, including BPAs. For instance, uh, a detailed analysis of the narrative origins of BPA's names, the stories those names are embedded in, and the consequences of those stories, can be used to contextualize this contemporary phenomenon within a very long literary and cultural history of the gendering of intelligent machines. And this can be a necessary component of the study of their contemporary social impact. So, um, oh, I'm trying to go through my slides on that. In a way. So there's loads of media coverage about why this is a problem, but it's all think pieces, it's not research. So what I was trying to do is kind of insert some research behind all these think pieces. So um, the origins of EPA's names have been widely discussed in these think pieces. Um, Alexa and Echo come from Greek mythology, from Ovid's telling of the Echo and Narcissus myth. Cortana is from the, the video game Halo, if you know it. Um, Siri means beautiful woman who leads you to victory. Cora, the new, I think it's the Royal Bank of Scotland one, uh, is an alternative name for the Greek goddess Persephone. So there's a whole other paper here on why Greek mythology is involving the naming of contemporary technology, but won't try and do that in 10 minutes. Um, but no detail, and I'm also not going to then look at these stories, because what I've got even further back, not the in between Greek mythology and now. Uh, nobody's looked at these uh, names in the context of the very first BPA, which was called Eliza after um, Pygmalion, George Bernard Shaw's play Pygmalion, which of course is also Greek myth, so we're going back to Greek myth again. Um, and no uh, public or academic discussion has contextualized our contemporary discussion of gender BPAs in relation to Eliza. Eliza was the uh, computer scientist Joseph Weibelmann's uh, name for his first natural language processing uh, program. Um, and there is Weibelmann, and there is George Bernard Shaw's Lay. Um, and in the bigger version of this paper, um, what I make a case for is sort of two methodologies that we can use in relation to this case study to strengthen this evidence base. One is close reading, which is the gold standard of English criticism in literary studies departments. Um, but I only discovered when Nora and Rachel read the paper, it's not <laughs> necessarily the gold standard in other disciplines, and, and Rachel Ray kind of said, you know, this is something that needs to be emphasised. For me, it's just the methodology we use. And the other is, um, is uh, what I'm calling reasoning by analogy. Um, so Alison Adam, who wrote, wrote one of the earliest books on gender and artificial intelligence in the late 90s, um, talks about the process of reasoning by analogy, which is actually very interestingly also some key part of AI and machine learning. But um, I uh, want to steal, sort of steal that and use it to argue that reasoning by analogy can be used as a method for demonstrating and explaining the relationship between the fictional world and the real world. So we can reason by analogy between literature and the real in order to deploy the insights of imaginative thinking in relation to real world problems and in order to understand how literature is implicated in real world effects. Now, Adams noticed feminist concerns about this because reasoning by analogy depends on norms that you're then extrapolating from, so it can consolidate norms. But I think actually that it also can be used as a form of feminist critique. So I don't have time to give you the, all the case analysis of the play, so I've kind of just chosen one moment to sort of give you a taste of the kind of reading that I'm doing. So, um, uh, how many people are familiar with Bison Bounds Eliza? 
No, okay, a little bit. Right, so uh, he published a paper in 1966 called Eliza, a computer program for the study of natural language communication between man and machine. It's a computer science paper, but he prefaces it with this kind of brilliant philosophical uh, comment on why he chose the name Eliza, um, why he's writing the paper, which is basically to demystify what's going on, because everybody who related to Eliza immediately anthropomorphized her. And he thought this was a really bad thing. Um, and he uses the classic, uh, the classic example later on in Computer Power and Human Reason, which he wrote 10 years later, of his secretary. Um, and this is some of the transcript, some transcript of the secretary, um, who sent him out of the room when she started uh, conversing with Eliza because she didn't want him privy to her um, private conversation. And uh, Weizenbaum calls this delusional thinking, with, of course, the female user of the, as the paradigm of this naivety. Uh, which is brought on in quite normal people, he says, even when only shortly exposed to a relatively simple computer program. And he was prompted to write the book to work fully through this idea of delusional thinking. But in the 1966 paper, he already acknowledges that an exploration of that delusional thinking um, has already happened, as he says, in the domain of the playwright. Um, so taking Weizenbaum's cue, what I do is a close reading of Shaw's play that shows how its thinking gives us a, a way of talking about and exploring all the questions that Eliza raises and every, every thing that's come after her in relation to gender and power in a dramatic context that's explicitly concerned with the relation between the artificial and the natural <coughs> and our inability to distinguish between those two things. Um, so uh, how many of time? Yeah. Do this, right, very quickly then. Um, so, uh, there's Pygmalion. I'm not going to do the Pygmalion myth, I'm going to assume you all know it. Uh, the one little bit of close reading I'm going to give you a taster of is this passage. Uh, Pickering. Uh, does it occur to you, Higgins, that the girl has some feelings? Higgins. Who oh, no, I don't think so. Not any feelings you need bother about. I got my feelings same as anyone else. <coughs> you see the difficulty? What difficulty? Because you talk grammar, the mere pronunciation is easy enough. So I think this is a brilliant example because you might assume that the difficulty is that she's got feelings, yeah? But the difficulty is not that she's got feelings, the difficulty is that she can't express that she's got feelings properly. He doesn't care about feelings at all. What he cares about is her language and her voice. So it's just a kind of beautiful moment of, of parody and humour in the play that has a very serious consequence, which is that the focus is not on the embodied woman, it's on simply what he's concerned with, which is whether she can speak properly or not. Um, and, and this moment um, highlights how women are habitually treated as objects and, and um, there's lots of languages of things and making in the play and so Eliza is, is a manufactured object um, <coughs> in order for men to do with as they wish but VPAs in fact are objects and can be treated as such without harm but when they're gendered, and this is what I'll finish with when they're gendered, an analogical relationship between them and real women is established, one which both performs and produces societal perception that all women, digital and real, are objects without feelings. So the female gendering of VPAs creates an analogical relationship between real and artificial women that doesn't just reproduce discriminatory stereotypes, but in fact produces the ontological categorization of woman as object. And this categorization traverses the real and the digital world and legitimates patterns of behavior in the digital world, which can then transfer to the real world and treatment of real women without differentiation. Because of that analogical effect, the final point is what's really interesting about voice technology um, is that, um, if I skip ahead to Nass and Brave, what they've shown in the, in the studies is that when we listen to an automated voice, our brain responds to it in exactly the same way as it responds to a human voice. So when we are conversing with artificial female voices, our brain does not distinguish between conversing with real women. So whereas the whole of my paper is based on a, an argument about analogical relationships, when it comes to voice technologies, it's actually a real relationship, which then poses even more potential for societal harm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm disappointed, but maybe not surprised to see that the earlier conversation between Eliza and the secretary is all focused on men and doesn't even pass the Beckdale test. No, so well, the, um, maybe we should be surprised. Eliza and designed Eliza on the model of Rogerian psychotherapy. 
So the idea was that it was meant to be a psychoanalytic right. thing, but even so, it's about boyfriends. Okay, exactly. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks. Um, so, uh, let's start my time. Um, so yes, um, thanks. Um, just to give you a bit of background about um, my kind of disciplinary uh, history. So I started out in philosophy, um, and then I did the PhD that was in between computer science and law, and then for the last three years I've been working in the computer science department. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, never fully comfortable anywhere, but um, can kind of see uh, some interesting developments that, that often replicate debates or go over old ground that has been dealt with in other disciplines. So I'm going to try and give you a sense of what's been going on in this kind of small but rapidly growing niche in computer science, which deals with the notion of fairness in the context of machine learning. So terms like fairness obviously have a huge amount of baggage and a lot of interpretation to be done on them, but um, in the computer science uh, machine learning um, kind of world, Fairness is, is, is kind of invoked as a, a proxy for something like discrimination. Um, so if you, if you, if you think about um, machine learning is there to try and spot patterns in data. And the aim is to get data, find a pattern, <coughs> and then be able to classify or predict a new instance that you haven't seen before. And the machine learning model is the thing that you, that you um, generate having looked at the data and that model is then used to classify things. So obviously, not very surprising that the data that is used in these models often reflects um, the biases that are in the real world. So um, kind of famous cases include um, uh, word embeddings. So it's part of natural language processing, which is the aim of um, classifying natural language, generating it. Um, often what is done is um, you create a model of a language which kind of maps out all the words in the language in a geometric space. So you can talk about distances between words. Um, and so words like um, man and woman, uh, if you look at the distance between them and the trajectory that you take in a geometric space, it's very similar to the, the, the same journey you would take to go from uh, king to queen. Um, but unsurprisingly, it also reflects um, things like from um, from a computer programmer to homemaker, or from doctor to nurse, is the same trajectory. Um, so these things reflect uh, those kinds of biases about uh, uh, stereotypes about jobs and so on. Um, so the question that computer scientists have been asking themselves is, well, what what would make one of these systems fair? Uh, and so there's kind of a few different definitions. So um, they they they're actually a large number of definitions which you could think about in kind of three classes. So one says anti-classification, so your model shouldn't consider um, the protected characteristic, in this case, gender. Um, so if your model doesn't include gender, that's fine. Another one says, well, we want to equalize outcomes in some way. So if we're trying to work out who to hire, and we'll sift them through a bunch of CVs, um, we want our model to give um, equal positive outcomes to men and women. Or it might be based on the errors. So if our, we know that our model is going to have some false positives, so it's going to pick out some CVs of people that probably aren't going to be good at the job. Um, error parity says that the false positive rate should be the same for them. Really. And then finally, there's calibration. So this says, let's say we have a criminal recidivism prediction algorithm, um, and the aim is to predict whether or not someone will go on to commit a crime or be in prison. Calibration says that. The higher the score, the more likely that the people who are given that score um, do, do indeed go on to recommit the offence. So equal calibration which says that um, all of the uh, men who are given a seven score and all the women who are given a seven, equal numbers of them should go on to um, recidivate. That would be good calibration. And these all sound like you know, reasonable definitions or measures of fairness. But it turns out that they are often contradictory. So if you take... Um, you take um, error parity, so we want to have equal numbers of false positives for men and women, but we also want to have good calibration, then it's very likely that the base rates of recidivism are going to be different. Generally speaking, women are less likely to recommit offence. So in that case, if we try and impose both uh, good calibration and um, equal errors, then we're going to have to violate one or the other, because the base rates are unequal. 
Another example where um, these kind of basic definitions have turned out to be quite weird and perverse when you try and apply them is um, anti-classification and, um, and error parity. So let's say we're, we're, um, our model is cyclical through lots of CVs and we don't want it to consider gender, but we also want to um, accept an equal number of men and women. What the model will then do is go away and find proxies for gender that will allow it to increase the number of women, for instance. Um, so it will find hair length or, or something like that, which means that, perversely, um, men with long hair have a really good chance of getting it, and women with short hair um, don't do so well. Um, so these are kind of all weird, kind of perverse outcomes that happen when we apply these, these kind of slightly strange definitions of fairness. So my perspective is that the fundamental questions are really um, kind of philosophical and ethical ones. Um, and so I think there's a lot of use of, um, kind of feminist political philosophy uh, in this space. So um, what, there's, been a, there's been a bit of work trying to map conception of political philosophy into this space. So one kind of popular account of egalitarianism is that um, people should be held responsible for disadvantages that they find themselves in if they're a result of choices that they made freely of themselves. Um, people like Elizabeth Anderson have criticised this and saying, well, some choices that people make actually redistribute disadvantages. So if you forego a lucrative career in order to look after a loved one or someone else, you're redistributing disadvantages, but it's not the same as if the choice that you've made to you know, pursue a, 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 a extreme sports and therefore have a face higher insurance premiums. So that's something that was freely chosen by you and it didn't have any effect on anyone else. Whereas the person who foregoes the well paid career or to look after someone else, we might want to treat that choice differently and the responsibilities and burdens from that choice should be different. Um, so I think that these questions fundamentally come down to more philosophical ones rather than dancing around with these different um, statistical measures of fairness. Um, so, I'll just briefly mention a few things that I think are kind of interesting um, <coughs> in this space. So, a couple of years ago there was a paper, great paper by um, uh, Catherine D'Ignazio and Laura Klein called Feminist Data Visualization. I think when it came out, a lot of people were saying, well, surely data visualization can't be, is there enough space for there to be a feminist data visualization? I think they make a few really good points which are worth uh, bearing in mind. So they start out by talking about um, Donna Haraway's um, amazing passage where she talks about how technologies like AI, AI um, have this kind of god trick. They, they, they make us think that they're coming from nowhere, coming from the perspective of nowhere. Um, but they suggest kind of three things that, that um, visualize, data visualization people should think about, which I think are worth thinking about in the context of AI. So first of all, you need to think about new ways to represent uncertainty. So often, uncertainty in data will be represented by like, null values or zeros. Um, but we need to think about ways of surfacing that as the technology comes out and is interacting with it. The second thing they talk about is referring to the material economy behind the, the data. I think this applies to AI as well. So if you think about that, there's an AI now project which is mapping all of the material um, kind of underpinnings of, of Alexa, so all of the different um, bits of the supply chain that, that have to be produced to, to create an Alexa. And then third, they say, invite this in. So just the way that we label data or the way that we label outcomes, they mention a case where there's um, an attempt to visualize um, deaths in um, a poor suburb <coughs> city where previously labeled accidents were renamed killings to sort of reflect that in the community that was that was suffering from these accidents, it was more um, representative for them to, to label the data as killing more than accidents. Um, so I think I'll stop there. But um, yeah, I think all those things can equally well apply to AI as they can apply to data visualization. Thanks, and a minute to spare as well. Very, very impressive. Um, I think it's really interesting looking at what technicians, computer engineers and scientists and mathematicians are doing specifically within the technical field because I think ultimately without taking into account the context in which a lot of these tools are employed, they're always going to be blunt tools not taking into account how they interact with the environment, with the previously existing set of circumstances. So. 
and I think it's a really good example when you give lots of excellent examples, but I really like the example about the misguided proxies to ensure fairness then. That, you know, the system, particularly machine learning, it, you know, life finds a way, machine learning tries to find a way as well, and doesn't actually reflect, you know, the ultimate objective of ensuring fairness between men and women in that particular situation. So there is a very unfortunate contextual collapse, and I really liked your reference to Laura Klein's paper about the fact that, well, uncertainty does need to be built in because the has to be redundancy to take into account all the different variables, but we'll stop now until we get to Q&A. But last but not least, Andrew, whenever you're yeah. ready, thank you. I have a few slides. Uh, it's going to be a presentation. Uh, well, I will give you a presentation. The slides are... Um, Uh, mine will be with quotes from basically the project that I've been doing for the last six years, uh, or small project that I've been doing uh, over um, digital work welfare services, digitalization and work administration, justice and, and, and rights um, in Eastern Europe and Poland. So I want to take you from, uh, for a short journey. Let's get out from this fancy little building uh, from London, from UK, and go uh, to Poland, to my home country, to Podkarpacie. This is, this is one of the poorest regions in the entire European Union, uh, the poorest region in, in, uh, uh, in Poland. Uh, approximately 9% of people are living below extreme poverty line, not the poverty line, extreme poverty line. And in Poland in general, the the poverty has a face of a woman. Women, women were hit like really badly during the transformation. They mm, lost jobs disproportionately uh, when we compare to, to, to men. Um, they have to face cuts in welfare and healthcare. They were also deprived of their of their reproductive rights because of the Catholic Church and conservative politicians. Um, so, with this context, we went to Podkarpacie a few years ago. Uh, it was in 2014 with this really nice small organization called Feminist Think Tank, and we asked women women who create this amazing small organization, Association of Large Families. This is a small organization that is helping women experiencing poverty, <coughs> and we ask. The, 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 the women who created this organization, but also the women who are um, having some kind of assistance from this organization about their experiences uh, on access to public services. And at that time, Poland started investing in digitalization of public administration. We received a lot of money from the European Union, and they invest in those new shiny tools, uh, like, you know, they start from applying uh, for benefits online, but then they ended up with um, algorithms that detect welfare fraud, algorithms that tailor uh, social assistance to individual needs, check eligibility, so all those new things. And we asked the women uh, in Podkarpacie to, to talk about also their experience with this. Of course, they didn't have any knowledge and neither awareness of what's going on. They only knew that there are some computers <coughs> in, the, in the office. But when we opened the conversation to talk about, in general, surveillance, privacy, data, they show us the really hostile environment, environment with low expectation of rights. When, oh, I will show you. This is basically, this is, a, this is the, 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 the picture from, the, from one of the meetings of the, of the, of the organization that I uh, talk about. And so um, and these are the, the, some of the voices of the women that, that we spoke. And uh, they, uh, so they open up the conversation, they talk about this low expectation of, of, of rights, um, that uh, there's a lot of surveillance, non-digital surveillance already existing. Um, uh, people are trying to catch them on errors, on, on mistakes, and basically the basic uh, strategy is to lie on each, on each step. Um, so, uh, so these digital tools enter this already hostile environment this environment when you can already have this surveillance. And when we spoke after that with, with, the, with the people uh, working at the Ministry of Labour, and we also went through the documentation, uh, basically the, the designers and the decision makers, well, the system were not designed to empower people, to help them. The, the, the basic need was to, um, to, 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 to have a better control, saving money, efficiency. This, that was the language. 
Um, also, what was important, the, when, we, when I went through one of the documentation uh, on one particular tool using job centers for, for profiling and categorizing people, there was full, uh, there was a lot of language this, showing this moral conception of poverty and unemployment, that this is individual responsibility, not a structural problem, almost like, you know, like reading the book from 19th century about criminology. Uh, that was one of the my 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 uh, my, my uh, really interesting <coughs> sorry that was really interesting uh, description about people experiencing poverty. There are typical life strategies about comparing what's better, whether getting up early and communicating to work or permanent allowance from the state. So this is this kind of language that they also try to inbuild into the systems. And a few months ago months ago, a few weeks ago, the Supreme Audit Office also concluded that uh, this, this particular tool uh, was also leading to discrimination and unequal access to the to, to welfare system, especially hitting uh, single moms and women uh, that are taking care of their uh, elderly parents. So, uh, mm, so those, those tools become like deeply political things, issues, and artifacts. However, they exist in really non-transparent zone and citizens that do not have a control over them. But what is also interesting, and when we were doing this target research two years ago on this profiling tool in job centers, it was really hard. Well, when those systems entered this living organizational organizations, this living mechanisms of welfare systems, and it's really hard to define to, the, uh, to, 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 to divide what is technology and what is not technology, what is a human agency and what is not. This is like a really complicated mechanism that, 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 that appeared there. So with those, um, with, with those problems and with those problems to understand what's the real role of technology, I, I think I would like to have like three points. And I'm referring to the paper that we, are, uh, that we just wrote with, with my friend uh, and colleague Sita Gangaran on the centering technology in the discussion about social justice and algorithmic discrimination. That maybe uh, we have to start from a different point when we are talking about social justice and artificial <coughs> intelligence and automated systems, uh, basically data-driven systems. I would like to start from listening to the people, to listen from the suffering, to listen to the misery, and also to listen to, li to listen to basically to listen to the victims, and then to understand the crime. Um, so that and then try to understand what is the real injustice, what's the real problem, and if we will find that technology, algorithmic systems, are taking part in creating those injustices, we have to realize that those. Uh, injustices do not have the technological origin. They stem from political choice, the human choice, human choices over policy, money, uh, and resources. So this is our. This is not the question only of technology and tweaking algorithms. This is to uh, talking and asking questions about politics, like big politics. And uh, also, uh, I think when we start from this, this centering, I would like to also dis discover and explore new strategies and mobilizations and maybe remedies. And I'm referring here to the, the feminist, if I'm thinking here about human rights, for example, I'm referring here to feminist critics of human rights in general, because for a very long time, we have been thinking, when we think about human rights, we have been thinking about this narrow understanding of human rights, very individualistic um, freedoms. And I think we are also doing, maybe not this kind of mistakes, but we are also thinking about uh, with this kind of approach uh, in, in technology when we are for, we, for a long time we're only stressing privacy individual data protection and I would like to also explore different areas because human rights language is far more than that for example socio-economic rights is really missing framework here and <coughs> I think we can also explore new language and vocabularies and try to link for example data protection with socio-economic rights we haven't done this yet but I think we are starting uh, to do that. Um, and the last point, really last point, uh, I also hope that we will, when we think about AI and social justice, we will also explore different um, social contexts, <coughs> political contexts, because for, for a long time this debate has been shaped by US-based cases and examples. I need something more. And I hope those, those 
there's examples from Eastern Europe, uh, from my country, but also try to give you some more examples and understanding of what social justice means in, 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 in this discussion. Because, you know, in U US based discussion, it has their own political, racial tensions, class tensions. In my country, it's, it's something more than that. We have this history of post communist administration, state, etc. This is giving you a very different context to talk about technology. And I think I will finish here. So just a quick follow-up question about the systems you mentioned, yeah. the AI systems for yeah. the algorithms well, yeah. yeah. for the wel for welfare management, essentially. Yeah. yeah, basically. And were they designed solely by public authorities, or were, was the mm -hmm. private sector also involved? Uh, private sector was involved. Some of them were uh, designed in-house. Okay. Uh, some of them were bought, um, bought from local uh, or national, uh, small national IT company and uh, you know they didn't spend a lot of money like I think that was 10 million uh, uh, 10 million pounds if I will count uh, uh, now but so they were also really badly designed mm -hmm. uh, they have this political uh, they, they have a policy in build like really bad policy in build in them but and also they are badly designed um, and when we also spoke with welfare, uh, serve, um, welfare workers, uh, worker officers, uh, basically this, ba by the way, this is the, the other side of the of the of of, of the base um, of, of poverty. Basically, welfare officers in Poland are predominantly women. This is a really badly paid job. Nobody wants to do that, and there is a lot of tensions involved in that. Uh, so also, the, sorry, sorry I'm, 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 I think I'm talking too much, but they also said that when they are using those tools, basically they have bad in, uh, inter, in, uh, the, the, the design of, the, of, of and how they are using these systems. It's really bad. They are not trained. Uh, so it's really bad environment also to use technology uh, in general, I would say. So the, those women... They are mostly in that role. They would be yeah. the frontline professional yeah. delivering the service. Yeah. So I would take it that the poor governance that you mentioned about these systems yeah. goes the whole way. That when they were setting yeah. up and designing these systems, they didn't bother to speak to them, to no. consult with them as to how it would work in practice. No, not at all. No, no participation on any any kind. Well, there was in some some way participation or, or public consultation of a legal act, but this is something different. You're 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 trying to design a system, a living system that will be um, take, taking decision about people, and uh, well, nobody cares, I think. Uh, and this is this is this is also the you know the history because this is the the post-communist administration that prioritized subordination over participation, uh, being loud over having rights, and control over trust. Uh, so I think this is also a different political um, context of doing policy about technology. Thank you. That's so much to unpack there. Sorry? Leave it. No, not at all. I'll just leave it for the, the Q&A so we can all maybe contribute and talk more about that. So, thanks so much, Joachim, for coming and talking to us today. It's been very diverse and rich set of presentations covering an awful lot of ground. So Rachel, it would be great to hear your response to any of it. Thank covering. you. Um, these are four really brilliant and fascinating presentations that speak in very different ways to some of the work um, that I'm doing now and have done in the past because my background is, is English literature, it's human rights, it's philosophy uh, and it's looking at the intersection of sort of law, technology and society. So different ways I took a lot, so this is probably going to be a number of very scattered thoughts, but I'm just going to respond to, to some of the points raised, because I think that particularly this idea, Nina, that you raised about the voiceless bodies and the disembodied voices, mm -hmm. um, it, it's really profound, it's a really interesting point that um, I think ties into the issue of the invisible work the invisible labour of women historically in this sector that, you know, with what we were talking about in terms of trying to map out the material economy behind the production of such technologies, it also sort of falls into that. It's like this fetishization of, of a woman's body, that it can be broken down and it can be it can be concatenated, right? Mm -hmm. But it also feeds into that idea that the women therefore 
she's created something, something that's always uncanny, that's always something other, that's always something that's like not quite fitting within society. Um, and, and I also thought this linked to that new book that's just been out today, um, Caroline Cedo Perez. Just a fascinating and really um, engaging book about the way in which um, many of these database systems that are created silence the experiences of women, of, of women and they're created around a normative male. Um, but, it, but it works much more than just at the level of, of silencing and, visit, and making invisible women. It also sort of writes their experiences for them. Um, which brought me to your point about how um, Eliza's language, Higgins literally programs Eliza, right? Her language is given to her, like the experiences of women are given to us in, in Caroline Credo's book. In, in, in terms of <coughs> women's, women's voices being used in technology, their speech is literally given to them. And I thought that this is just a really interesting point that goes back to so many of the stereotypes about, uh, about women, but also about the way in which women have been treated in society, where their roles are literally given to them. Um, I don't want to dwell forever and ever, but I, I had also read the um, article by Laura, is it Lauren Klein, or Laura Klein and Stephen Dignazio. Um, and in terms of thinking about this idea of, of remedies or how to think about addressing issues that, as you say, they're not just about the technology, they're about society, the politics of gender in society, they're deep structural issues and how far this idea of a feminist analysis um, can be brought in. Um, so I just wanted to go back to some of my own notes on that particular article, um, as, I, as I, I also gleaned a lot from it, so I also thought it was really, really interesting. And they talk about how we need to look at the representations, or the lack of representations in terms of invisible labor, for example, in technology. Um, but also about this notion of deconstructing the binaries, and I thought of your work on deconstruction. That seems to be this whole problem with natural language processing, is it's based on these binaries. No one's done a Derrida deconstruction of the ways in which binaries are never binaries. The male and the female are always intertwined. The male is within the female, the female within the male. And it's always a complex relationship, right? And it's also that question of how far can these technologies address this? And how far does this go outside of the technologies? And is something that just we can't just give to the technologies to, 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 to be the continued solution for problems that they are embedding and creating to an extent. Um, and then the other one that I think that was spoken about in this article is the idea of embracing pluralism and how that works. And Yenjek, I, I found your presentation really, really moving. I think I've spent a lot of time looking at the lecture in Syria and Cortana, but I come from South Africa where I've been for a number of years, and I keep thinking to myself, why is this analysis important? for somewhere like South Africa where these technologies have not yet reached um, and is this a kind of white woman problem that I am spending a lot of time focusing on and, and, and that goes back to also the history of the naming and the creation of these characters that they're, they're not just women, they're also white women and how, what is the distance that's then created in terms of the racialized world where you have these technologies that are at the cutting edge of where society is at, and they're depicted as something white. Um, and then, I mean, I haven't really delved deep, deep into this analysis, I think there's more to be done here, but I just thought that your point about recognizing the suffering and the misery was just so poignant, um, and it really stops you um, from it really sort of stops you in your tracks and makes you sort of humble to the realities of what these systems are producing and what their effects are. Um, and, you know, then thinking about the, the extent to which this kind of feminist framework and, and the embracing of pluralism must also think very pluralistically about people's experiences and how people's experiences need to be mapped into the different processes and even our own processes as academics in trying to think about how to address 
um, that one are quite crucial concerns and that work on both on a lot of different levels. So yeah, I will end it there. <coughs> That's really, really, really interesting. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Just before we open up to the floor, would any of the panelists like to respond to any of the earlier presentations or any of the points raised by Rachel? Yeah, yeah. I told you, didn't I? <laughs> Listen to my voice. Um, it, it was to pick up on the, the binary. So um, Rachel and Nora were up in Cambridge a week or so ago, uh, where I had a big AI and gender um, workshop. And it was called Gen AI and Gender on Purpose, not AI and Women, precisely in order to um, open up those kind of questions. I'm kind of giggling at the idea that I could bring deconstruction to data science. I thought it was going out and then taking it to film studies, but <laughs> maybe that's my next challenge. Um, but I think uh, what, one of the things that came up at that workshop, the last session we had was a kind of brainstorming of the types of research projects. So we, we were trying to develop a research agenda in that. In, 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 about them, an AI and gender research agenda. Um, and so we broke it into small groups, and one of the groups had our non-binary uh, speaker in it. And one of the ideas that we came up with was speaking to something that I've been thinking about in my own work, which is um, what quantity of the qualitative do you need before it counts as evidence? So, you know, if one person says, I can get an exit to work because I'm a woman and my voice is high, or if one person of colour says, um, I can get a soap dispenser to work because I've got black skin, and that's an actual, you know, there's a video online that shows they put a white paper towel on, and it works, and they take the white paper towel off. Um, is that evidence? No, that's anecdote. Uh, but how much big qualitative data do you need before it's taken seriously? And so I think your project is absolutely spot on. Um, and that was a project that we came up with because um, Oz Keating, who was the non-binary speaker, said, you know, there's no point encouraging transgender and non-binary people into tech um, when you're encouraging them to develop the systems that are subjugating them. Like, that's, that's just not going to happen. Um, why not listen to them? And that's exactly what we're saying. You know, could you create some kind of oral history project of all the ways in which these um, technologies, specific technologies, are affecting the non-normative person that they're designed for? So I think that's a way of bringing non-binary thinking in, in that respect, at least through a kind of experiential qualitative project. I'm still a little uncertain how you bring <laughs> deconstruction in, but I'll, I'll have a work on that. <laughs> Just in terms of natural language processing of male and female, but yeah. yeah. There we go, she's just going to deal with natural language processing. Well, it would be interesting what you would make of AI if you were still alive. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure many of us would understand when we include it. Yes, yeah, sorry, just start. Uh, really, uh, thanks for your response. Um, on the voices, body, bodily, body, body <coughs> voice, I mean, like, in a sense, it's the kind of issue of the West in a certain sense, like the separation of the polis and the oikos, right? So the mother's body, in a sense, like, is on the side of domus and domesticity. And actually, for the woman's voice and body to coincide is, like, is uncanny, did you say, right? It's, it's, still, a, it's still a kind of, like, constitutive... Uh, question and issue of representation and politics like because the police you know in a sense like still isn't really like that and then it's, it's very strange how that's still the case in some way and I think this question about like having your own voice like learning to speak in your own voice I mean like women girls are encouraged you know like to be comforting to say what people want to hear it's actually very 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 hard to speak in your own voice and like some of the work by Joanna Cabrera I just want to mention where she speaks very, very beautifully about the uniqueness of everybody's voice. And I think that kind of is a very political, very complicated question about what it is to actually hear and listen, like the individual voice. And I wonder if some of these, like, you know, disembodied voices, the, the kind of, you know, the secretarial voices that are routinely abused, um, <laughs> you know, actually take us away from the something about the individuality of every single person's voice, you know, the beauty of the voice, the human voice. And I mean, that sounds quite traditionalist, but it sort of is and it isn't. Like, and I think I'm always on the side of the human and the specific. Mary Boyd's The Incident Book, Woman and Power, has a nice kind of, back to Greek. And Anne Cart's work as well is actually all about the, you know, the uniqueness of the human voice. Cameron Rowe was uh, uh, got her paper last year, and she's, it's interesting, she's deeply sceptical of the sceptical of social media. Yeah, um, uh, and, and I yeah. think that comes from her political work on the research, yeah. particularly Twitter. She's very popular.